Hi, everyone. Welcome. My name is Katie Lichtai. I am with the Iowa State University Alumni Association, and joining me is Matt Van Winkle, also on staff at the Alumni Association. Hi, Matt. Hey, Katie. How are you today? I'm doing well, I'm excited uh, for yeah. today's topic. I have a lot yeah, to learn about gardening. I do too. Yeah, I'll, I'll be honest. I do not personally have a garden myself. I have very little. We moved into our house uh, right before the pandemic and just haven't done much gardening of anything. So I'm really excited to learn from a couple experts here today. Me as well. And I think a lot of people are excited for today's event because we had a great response. We had nearly 800 households yes. sign up for today's event. 37 states are represented and even someone from Canada. So if you're wow. watching, if you're the one from Canada watching, hello, hello from Canada. I, love, and just, I always love seeing where people are coming in from. We got Chicago in the area right here in Ames, Iowa watching. Uh, yes, so we Paul, love Minnesota, that. So yeah. Keep them coming to let us know where you're watching from. Um, that's a really fun aspect of these virtual events is being able to see who is all joining us as, as we're learning um, some great information. Yeah, um, hundreds of you already joining us today watching. We see your comments coming in. Uh, and we know a lot of people are going to be asking questions, right, Katie, throughout the day. Yes. So um, we're going to do our best to get those questions to our experts here today. Um, just type those. We see you know how to use the chat already. We see those flooding in. So keep adding those into the chat on YouTube. Add your comments on if you're watching on Facebook. Hello. Uh, so put those in the, in, in the chat in the comments. We'll do our best to, to answer those here today. Great. And we also have some um, ISU prize packs to give away during the event today. I say we go ahead and give away one right now. Yeah, what let's do, you do think, it. Matt? Sounds right. good. So the first winner is Kathleen Allen from Omaha, Nebraska. Congratulations, Kathleen. Um, we will be in touch after the event and let you know how you can get your prize. Awesome. Congrats, Kathleen. Very cool. Omaha. Not too far away from where we are today here in no, Ames, Iowa. No, so, all right, Katie, should we bring on our presenters? Let's do it. Let's bring on Susan DeBleek and Lisa Nunnemaker. Hey guys, <laughs> okay. or girls, Please. I should say. <laughs> <laughs> Welcome. How are you all? Thank you. Great. Thanks for inviting us today. Yeah, yeah I bet some people really want to be out in the garden today. We hit <laughs> one of those sunny days. Yes, absolutely. Yeah. Beautiful day to get out there. And Katie was saying she was at the, the store the other day and saw lots of people already out in the garden section. So obviously a lot of you guys are excited as well. Uh, so Lisa, you teach in the ISU Department of Horticulture and Susan mm -hmm. coordinates the ISU Extension and Outreach Master Gardener Volunteer Program. And Susan, I hear there's a great opportunity for people right here in the state of Iowa this fall. Is that right? Yeah, so the Master Gardener training is over 40 years old and has gone through a lot of changes as it's trained over 15,000 people in Iowa. And this year we're offering it as an online course. And so people are going to be able to do the material at their own pace on their own time. And in terms of the topics, we've got a range of topics um, from vegetables to fruits, trees, design, that sort of thing. And um, the course starts on August 30th, and it's going to take advantage of that little book you see in the lower right hand corner, which is our resource guide for Iowa Master Gardeners, which you can get in the ISU Extension Store for $39. That's a really great tool. And um, yeah, just excited to be able to offer this to people who are in the state of Iowa or in surrounding um, states. And yeah, like I mentioned, the 17 topics from house plants, native plants, trees, design, uh, hoping that there's something for everybody and that people discover a topic that maybe they didn't know they were excited about. Very cool. Awesome. Great information there. And we're going to share some links as well in the comments for you guys to be able to check out. Um, we'll put those in here throughout the, the next hour. So be, be in the lookout for those in the comments as well. All right. I think uh, unless there's anything else we want to talk about right now, I think we're ready to turn it over for to Lisa and have her take it away. Great. Right. Thanks, Perfect. Lisa. Thank you. I was just reading all of the comments and it's so fun to see that everybody's from all over the place. So this is really cool. 
And I'm going to try to stay focused, but we're going to we're going to try to watch your questions when we can. And if we need to stop for a little bit, we'll we'll maybe take a long break in the middle. But just a really quick information about me. So as Matt had mentioned, I teach in the Department of Horticulture at Iowa State, and my background's in landscape architecture. So I teach the landscape design classes. So we will be focusing on design uh, uh, topics today. So I. Not, I won't have questions or I won't have answers and information about fertilizers or anything like that. We're going to be focusing on design and how we arrange things in the landscape and, um, and more of the aesthetics end of things. Okay, so we're going to jump in. And if any great questions come up that are pertaining to the topic at hand that we're discussing, then we'll go ahead and try to answer those or we'll try to do a whole bunch at the end also. Okay, so let's go. So the first thing I always love to talk about, because I want to make sure we're all on the same page, is the difference between planting design and spatial design. So we are all going to be amazing designers when we're done with this talk today, and we're going to understand the differences between these. Now, I'm going to try this out and see how this goes with so many people watching, but I am curious, does anybody know what spatial design is? If you were just to throw a word out or two words out, does anybody know what spatial design is out of curiosity? I'm curious to see what people would say. Spatial design and landscape design. Any thoughts on that? I don't know how much of a of a delay we yeah, have. There's like a 10 second delay. Oh, there so is. We and we are we're gonna keep going then. <laughs> we're living, we're living in the past. These people are in the future. I guess, or maybe we're in the future. I don't know how that would work. <laughs> Thanks, Matt. Yeah, but we I'll I'll put those comments up if you if you guys want to follow along. Oh, here's one. Karen's Perfect. got a nice how much you can fit in a space, layout, use of space. Excellent. 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 I'll keep looking at them as they come in also. Perfect. A lot of people are using the same words, use the space. So basically when we look at a landscape, landscape design in particular, since we're talking about that today, there's two different things that we need to consider. How we actually design the rooms or the spaces, the overall spaces, and then there's planting design. And I'm going to just go through each of those really quick. So the spatial design is kind of the overall plan for a landscape. And I'll give you examples of these with images. I'm gonna have so many images today. And I promise I was gonna keep this to the time. So I'm gonna do my best to zip through all these amazing photos that I have. We're gonna organize, so spatial design is also organizing the spaces. Um, and Jim's mentioning like, it's not inclusive to planting. We have blocks of space for, space for specific usage. I'm actually looking at the comments now and you have such great answers. So I wanna make sure I mention those. It's about creating the lawn shapes. So I'm, I'm saying lawn shapes in the United States, we have large lawns. If, if I was talking to some of you in different countries, you may not have lawns, but in our country, we do have large lawn spaces. So that is part of our spatial development. Um, and then it's determining, once we determine where those spaces are, this is where it tells us where the planting beds are. So again, I'm gonna have images here to show you all of this in a second. Whereas planting design is organizing the plants in the beds. So what often happens when many of us approach landscape design, we jump right into the plants and we wanna go buy plants and we're not sure where to put them and they're on sale. We were having a discussion about this before the show today that you know we wanna go out and buy plants, but have we done the spatial design yet to understand where the plants should go? Because you need to know where those planting beds are to be able to do that. With planting design, we wanna consider form, texture and color. So it's more that detail of, of that arranging and, and making sure that we are actually use the plant materials to reinforce the bigger spaces, okay? So I wanna make sure that um, we understand that difference because oftentimes we don't understand that. And I wanna make sure what we're talking about today is just the plants and how we arrange them in the beds. And, and to know that spatial design should probably be done ahead of time. And we should probably know where our outdoor rooms are but today we're gonna to talk about planting design. So here's an example of that. I need to have photos and images so we can see that. So here is a yard and we're looking at it from the sky, looking down and on the left side, can we, I don't know, can, can we see my, oh, we can't see my cursor. This is fabulous, good. So this is a laundry yard. So this would be a room or a space. And then we have a picnic lawn. Don't, don't we all have picnic lawns and reading nooks in our backyard? Um, but each of these are, a space or a room outside. So the planting design is what's happening in the beds between the spaces. So when we 
actually create our landscape design, we should be creating those rooms first and then using the plant materials to reinforce that. And you're gonna, you're gonna get this blasted in your head before I start talking about planting design because it's really important to me for everybody to understand this. So this is what we usually do. So this is, I call this negative space. We like to go to the store, we buy plants, we bring it home and then we just put it in the ground or we ring our house with plants or we, we don't really necessarily have a plan for them. We just start kind of putting things down. If you love it that way, that is great. But what often happens is that the instead of creating a room or a space with our plants, now we're just kind of throwing things in there. It's like building the house without thinking about what the rooms are gonna look like. We're just gonna start throwing walls and furniture all over the place without really thinking about what each room looks like. This is what we want our rooms to look like outside. I want them to be positive. We want them to be purposeful and we wanna use our plants to reinforce the rooms, okay? So let's, here's an example of an entire yard so we can see what this looks like. So this is again, a bird's eye view of a house. The brown is the house and we have a driveway and a sidewalk. And this is what we often do. We just, we buy plants and we, we just make these random beds and we put them in our yard and and this, is, and this actually isn't too bad, to be honest with you, but if we think through it, we can actually create beds that reinforce rooms or spaces. So the dark green would be the planting beds and the light green would be a lawn space. So now we're thinking about how we are purposefully placing beds to reinforce those spaces versus just throwing plants out there. And this is a hard concept. I know for my own students sometimes to grasp because we're so used to buying plants and then just ringing them around the house or putting them in, in different locations. But think about how you can create a space first. So that is my, my long talk about spatial design, but I wanna show you some examples also of some really great strong examples of spatial design too. So here's an example. And again, the lawn spaces are the light green. And if you look in those areas, you can see this is a really big room and the plants are all reinforcing that. And what I like to ask people, if when you are like, if I if you were to look at the space, and I like to actually, you know what, I'm gonna I'm gonna show you some other place spaces first, and I'm gonna ask you a question about these spaces. So here's a really large plan, and it's got a lot of garden rooms in it. So hopefully you can see this. There's a room here. There's a room over here on the right, top right. There's a room down here in the bottom right. So all of these are garden spaces that were created first and then the plantings are around them. So here is another great example of a great design. I, I always like to ask people, look at this beautiful lawn space. Do you feel like that these people went out, bought some plants and just plopped them in the ground and then this space just, ac just accidentally appeared? Or do you think they, they actually designed the lawn space and then use the plants to reinforce it. So my challenge to you today is to design your spaces, whether it's a patio, a lawn, and uh, what are, a deck, whatever that might be, and then have the plants reinforce that. So instead of having the bed be the positive space, make this, the spaces in between them the positive space. So always think about how you can design your lawn spaces. Excellent. I see that someone has a question here about, will my slides be available? I would encourage you to go on my website. Uh, I think uh, the link is at the beginning, at the end of this presentation, Paper Garden Workshop. And I have tons and tons and tons of information on landscape design. And if you go on there, you can get lots of great free content. So definitely do that. So hopefully that helps you a little bit. So this space right here, thank you, Matt. <laughs> um, I was telling him that I feel like we're in a, a sporting event with all these great little questions popping up. So here's another example of the space that's designed ahead. So again, it's a shift. I want you to think about, can you design your spaces versus having them just be left over? So here's another space. This patio was designed, even the lawn space was designed. Everything was designed, it wasn't just left over. So that's everything that you design in your yard, you should be, you should think about it. Even the lawn spaces, like what shape does your, do you want your lawn space to be? And then here's another great example of spatial design. The planting beds, I would say the planting design is not finished in this design. So don't look at the planting beds because that's not done. But the actual spaces, like 
what what's the shape that's being repeated here? I know I have a 10 second delay, so I'll just tell you it's circles. Um, so circles are being repeated over and over again, but do you see how they carefully designed each of those lawn areas and the sidewalks? It's all carefully designed, which is really cool. Okay, we're here to talk about planting design though, but I feel it's really important for you to understand that when we're designing our outdoor spaces, you need to think about the rooms outside first and to understand that planting design is to reinforce those rooms. And I have a whole nother talk that I, I mentioned, floors, walls, and ceilings in plants of, of outdoor rooms. When we create outdoor rooms, we should consider the floor of the room, the walls of the room, and the ceiling of the room. So for us, plant materials are often the walls and the ceiling, actually in the ground too, because turf is also um, a floor. But you need to think about plant materials in all of those planes, which is really important. So again, planting design is what's happening in the beds, okay? So the beds should be reinforcing the spaces that you live in, okay? The spaces that you play croquet in, that you play football in, that you eat in, that you barbecue in, the plants are emphasizing those spaces, which is really cool. So here's just some examples of planting design, and then we'll go through my 10 plus tips. I keep adding tips. I should make it a 12 plus tip presentation at some point because I'm gonna have more and more. But these are just some examples of, of the of planting design. So the space is already, the, the, the spatial design is already implemented or designed. Now we're gonna go in and try to figure out how do you arrange the plants. And I will tell you, spatial design um, is, a, is, a, is a trick in itself, is a skill in itself, but planting design is also very, uh, I don't wanna say challenging in a negative way, challenging in a good way. There's a lot of great things that you need to consider when you're pulling plants together especially when you see designs like this. So the design before this was Santa Fe. I don't know if any of you are in Santa Fe or in New Mexico right now, but love Santa Fe. And this one's in Boston. And this is an amazing garden, but look at that. I mean, you have to really think through that combination and how you pull those plants together. Love that. So the purpose of plants, and this is too bad we have the 10 second delay, but you can still kind of throw things out there if you want. But I always like to ask, why do we have plants in our yard? I mean, what is what is the point of putting plants in our yard? Um, I've already mentioned one to reinforce our our beds or our rooms rather. And but most of us don't even think about that. We usually have other ideas of why we are putting plants in our garden. And I'll start to list some and I'll see if any of you list other things, too. So we might use plants to screen views. There might be something that we don't want to see, or maybe there's a neighbor we don't like. We might even use plants to frame views, which is kind of nice. Also, there might be a beautiful view in the background that you want to frame. We want to use plants sometimes to give shade. Um, someone mentioned that they grow it for food. And someone else mentioned that they make it makes them happy. They like to cook with it. For medicinal purposes, for beautiful for beauty purposes, exactly. Tie the house to the landscape. So these are all from the comments right now, which is these are all fabulous. So all of those things, color and texture and all those wonderful things. Sometimes we'll use plants to control circulation patterns. Now, I understand if we have dogs and kids, sometimes that doesn't always work. But in general, most people understand that when there's a plants, when plants are there, they can guide you to where you want them to go and provide wildlife habitat and food. We've been mentioning food quite a bit. Um, so visual interests, I'm looking at the comments and seeing what else we got. So all, so many great things. So, um, but, the, but the big thing that we're gonna talk about today, plants do a lot of wonderful things for us. But again, I wanna make sure I stress that they also define spaces in our yard. And I'm, the reason I'm, def I'm stressing that in particular because I think that's one thing that we don't always think about. So I wanna make sure that we remember that also. So yeah, we're lucky to have plants and we all talked about how we're all addicted to them and we wanna fill up our car with plants every spring and I cannot wait. Some of you probably already do that. Oh, I love this one. So your house does not look naked. I love that. <laughs> That's great. So yeah, there's a lot of, lot of great reasons why we have plants. So again, Today I'll be focusing more on making sure that our plants are reinforcing our spaces. So here's a landscape design, a drawing from, again, the sky looking down. And then there's the space, that's the living space. That's the space that we use, but the plants are all around that space and reinforcing it. And here's another beautiful landscape from the sky looking down. And you can see that lawn space perfectly designed 
and all the plants are reinforcing it, which is really cool. And of course the patio too. The patio is easier to see, but it's always the lawn I feel like we forget about. Perfect. So now let's talk about some planting design tips. We have 10 plus, I think I might even have 11 or 12. Who knows how many I have? I've, I've got a lot. But these are some great tips to think about and hopefully it'll help you as you buy plants, as you put them in your yard, as you divide plants and share them with your friends. Think about all these different tips as you arrange them. So the first one, and a lot of you have probably have heard of this, is to try massing your plants rather than having one of everything. A lot of us are collectors of plants and we tend to want to have one of everything because we want to try everything. And I was, we were talking before um, we went live tonight or today and we were saying like, when I go to the store, I may have one particular plant in mind, but if I see that there's a sale on boxwood and I can get 15 of them and I'm, I'm going to buy all 15 of them because then I can create a hedge with them. I can create a massing with them. I can do something really cool with them with a mass of them versus if I just had one. Now, sometimes you do want just one because sometimes you just need a focal point or you just need a specimen in a certain area and that's perfectly fine. But if you can mass your plants, it's awesome. And it makes a, such a statement, which is really cool. So here's a great design. And you can see when you mass plants and you have a lot of them and, and you're grouping like two or three at a time. Like one thing that I always suggest is when you, when you go to the nursery, try to buy at least three of something, at least. Or this is my other trick. And I know nursery people probably don't like this. But if I'm buying a plant, if I, I'll look at it to see if I can divide it into three plants. So like Allium is a great example of that or a hosta or something like that. But if you, if you know you can divide it into three, then you can get one big one and then maybe just divide it. But try to get at least three. Um, I know my boyfriend is, already makes fun of me because I come home with a whole load of, of not just, like I said, 10 plants of different kinds. I come back home with a car of 10 of the same plants because I'm always trying to get great masses going in our yard. And we just bought our house. It's been actually a year. We just bought it a year ago. So we are right at the start of filling in our yard, which is really fun. So here's just some more examples of massing plants. This house is in Memphis. And again, they're really great. If you can see these shrubs along the walkway here, they're massing those plants. And massing plants is a great way to unify your landscape too. We're not gonna talk about design principles a whole lot. I will a little bit, but uni unif unifying or unify is one of the design principles. And one great way to unify a landscape is to repeat plants over and over again, which is really cool. And one thing we do want to make sure that we think about, so here's another beautiful design where we're massing plants. I want to make sure I'm clear when I say massing plants, it doesn't necessarily mean you should use one plant in your entire yard. It is important to have diversity in your plant materials. And a design like this, it looks like there may only be three plants, but there can be 10 different plants in this design. And if you do it right, and, and this, there's another talk that I give on advanced planting methods, and there are some planting methods that make it look very simple, but they're very complex in terms of plants because they take turns blooming. So if you do it right, you can have a very diverse landscape, but aesthetically make it look very clean and simple. If, if that's what you're looking for, it can also be different than that. But I want to make sure I stress that massing does not necessarily mean uh, only one plant. So you still want some diversity in your landscape. Excellent. So here's another great example of massing. And these are, this is more drift planting. And I don't know if this is Pete Audolf, but he is a great drift planting designer. He's Dutch. And I just love this when you can actually have masses of plants of the same plant in a, a big grouping like this. And then this is just a, a simple design, but I don't know if you can see, I don't know if these are boxwoods, but they kind of look like that. There's what in this design, like there's maybe three different plants. There's not a lot there, but again, they're massing and it looks really beautiful. They could even do more than this, but this is a great start. And then this is just, I, I like to show you some drawings sometime too, because if some of you are actually drawing your designs when you're, when you're actually pulling your ideas together. So this would be an example of when you're massing plants in plan view, if you're drawing them. So all the plants that are connected would be the same species. So you can see in a plan like this that there's a lot of massing going on. So there's what, four or five different plants here, but then they're being massed together. Okay, so hopefully it helps to kind of see it in a plan view and a drawing also for those of you that like to design and, and create on paper also. 
which is fun. That's like the best part also. We get to dream in the winter time and then go buy the plants in the spring. For those that are in the Midwest, some of you are in warm places, you can do it year round, which is cool. So number two, planting tip number two is very similar to planting tip number one, but more specific. Now, some of you have probably have heard of this, the idea of planting in odd numbers versus only doing two plants, we should do three plants. Um, and the higher the number, so once we get to eight or 10, you don't have to do that anymore because your eye does not see the even number anymore. And you might ask, why would you need to do this? So when you see two plants, for some reason, our eye sees two plants. But once you start putting it into a grouping of odd numbers, like three or five or seven, your eye sees it as a massing instead. So that's where that, that idea comes from, is making sure that um, you see the mass and not the individual plants. So these, this is just some great examples of that. And this is a beautiful planting. Like look how amazing that is when everything's massed and putting put in odd numbers versus just having one plant of everything throughout that bed. And this is Adam Woodruff. He's in, he's in Minneapolis, or not Minneapolis, he's in Missouri. Um, amazing designer, but again, he's repeating things. He has odd numbers, he's massing. It's absolutely beautiful. So Cheryl has a question. Any recommendations for apps to build out a design like that? I have no clue. I do it by hand. <laughs> That's a great question, Cheryl. I don't know. Maybe somebody else here has used that. Usually I see um, apps and computer programs as a fancy pencil. So as long as you can find something that you can draw with, SketchUp, uh, Dynascape's a great one, Vectorworks, but those are all kind of expensive programs for people that do it professionally. SketchUp's free. You can do a free version of that. Um, but oftentimes, yeah, there's no, I don't think there's an app that actually helps you lay it out like that. There's lots of computer programs. And actually, I did, Matt, I did not get, include a link, but on my website, I do have a, Actually, it might be the first blog post. It's called Digital Drafting Options. So if you go on my website, you can find all the, the digital drafting programs that are on there. So hopefully that answers that question. What do you think about virtual landscape design services like Yardzen? I don't know Yardzen. That's a new one for me. I, I don't have an answer for that because I've never looked at them. But afterwards, I'm going to go look. So I don't know. That's a great question. Excellent question. And Matt is so wonderful. Look, at he found the link. Matt, like, that's amazing. He's like the perfect assistant. He's, he's having my, his assistant. I'm his assistant here. <laughs> but yeah, thank you, Matt, for finding that. That's great. So definitely look at those digital drafting options. But again, a, just so you know, a computer is just a fancy pencil. So hopefully you can do, you can do things on grid paper too. Grid paper is amazing if you don't want to go on the computer. Love that also. And my website's got tons of drawing options on there too. So getting back to things in odd numbers, I just wanted to show you some examples of that. Even topiary and cool things like that can be in odd numbers. And this is a common question I get, so I like to bring this up in this in this presentation. Oftentimes people will ask me, well, is it okay if you have to do odd numbers and do it, what, can we have like two plants at the either side of the door? Because there's both of these plants are here and they're the same but there's two of them. So am I breaking the rule by having these two plants in front of the door? And oops, we lost it. There we go. No, you are not breaking the rule because this is a group of one and a group of one because they're not touching each other. So a mass would be plants touching each other. So that, like I said, this is a very common question I get. So I just want to make sure I point that out. It's great to have a plant on either side because one of the purposes of planting design, which I'm surprised I don't have in this PowerPoint is you want to emphasize your front entry to your house. So when you are doing your front yard and your backyard, you always want to emphasize where the entrance is to the building. So that's really important. That's one of the functions of planting design. Excellent. So number three. So I mentioned earlier that form, texture, and color are three of the important elements that you consider when you're doing planting design. So I'm going to talk about all three of those right now. And I will tell you, I don't know how many of you have heard of form, texture, color. If you go through the Master Gardener program, I'm pretty sure we talk about that in the Master Gardener program also. But when you put any plants together, you should always consider the form of the plant, the texture of the plant, and the color of the plant in that order. Form is the most consistent. So you need to put the most emphasis on form. 
year round, and at least in the Midwest, um, form is there year round. So that's the most important. Whereas color is the most fleeting. We, we put a lot of emphasis on color, but color comes and goes in the, in the garden often, not, not all plants, but most plants. So it's really important we put the most emphasis on forms first. And this is kind of a secret of landscape design. For those that this is a new, inf some of you may know this already. For those that don't know this, form is a secret that I'm gonna share with you today. And if you wanna design, this is, I will hear, actually, I don't know if the next slide shows it, it does, good. So actually, let's go back to this one. So these are some typical forms for plants. When you learn plants, learn the form of that plant because we are creating a composition when we are doing a landscape design. So it isn't just, we're putting plants in the ground and, and, and having this beautiful landscape. It's beautiful because we're considering the composition of them. So all plants have a form. They're, they're columnar, they're vase-shaped, they're round, they're mounded, they're horizontal, they're pyramidal, oval, all, all kinds of different shapes. It's really cool. So here's an example of that. So here's a garden shed, and here's two totally different compositions that I can do with plant forms. So if you understand plant forms, you can create these amazing compositions. And I had mentioned before that when you're doing it, like, like one of the things that I love to do, so this is my little secret, take a photo of your house. Let's just say the front of the house. Put some tracing paper over it. Or if you, speaking of digital options, okay, I got one for you. <laughs> Going back to the digital option question, um, I think it was Cheryl that asked that. I like to use my iPad also. So you can do tracing paper over your house, or you can take a photo with your iPad and then use a program like Procreate, or um, I use Adobe Draw, and there's a lot of programs that you could use to do this. And you can, on the tracing paper or on your iPad, start drawing these plant forms and start thinking about, do I want a round plant there? Do I want a tall plant there? Do I want a vase-shaped plant there? And you start creating these compositions. And even if you don't know your plants well, you can start here. You may have to go back and fix things if you can't get a plant that fits. But then you can take it to the nursery and then they can help you maybe find some plants that are close to that. And if you have to change it a little bit, then you can do that. So plant form is a very magical thing. So if you can, besides leaving here and understanding the, the difference between spatial design and planting design, I'm hoping form is something magical for you too, because it's actually really cool once you understand this. So you can use tracing paper, throw it on a photo of your house and draw some cool plant forms just like this and explore different ideas. Or you can do it on an iPad. An iPad's pretty cool to do that on also. So Cheryl, I know it's not a landscape program or an app necessarily, but it's just a drawing program. And it's another great way that you can draw digitally if you want to. So here's some examples of plant forms in the landscape. I'm gonna highlight them with these little circles. So here's some moundy shapes or some more low shapes. Here's some more circles or upright shapes. Then we have some more pyramidal shapes. And look at how interesting this landscape is because we have a variety. You wanna repeat plants but you also want a variety of plant forms. So you, so it's this fine line, you wanna mask things, but then you want a variety of plant forms to keep it interesting. So you need to try to do both. So here's some other examples of some great plant forms. Now we don't have these particular plants here in the, well, we might have actually uh, skyrocket juniper. I don't know, this, these aren't skyrocket junipers, but in some parts of the country, you, some of you can grow plants like this but you can do some really cool things with really strong forms. And these particular strong forms are leading you, leading you to the entrance because we don't know where the entrance is. So they're using planting design to lead you there. And these plant forms are strong. So you're very intrigued with them and you wanna go see what they look like. And then here's some more moundy plants kind of creeping up and then you've got the round plants in the back. And I love these, like we have spiky plants, we have moundy plants, like this, this was done so well. You wanna have a great mix of all of those. And for those that are in container gardening, this is how container gardeners use form. They use thrillers, fillers, and spillers. And some of you have probably have heard of this before, but the thrillers are usually the big spiky, big plants that come out the top. The fillers fill in the middle, and then the spillers droop, kind of drop out over the, the side of the container. So that's how container gardens use form also, which is really cool. Excellent. So let's go to number four, which is we, have, we did form. Now we're gonna talk about texture. And texture is something that I never really understood <clears throat> until I started doing planting design myself out of school. But basically you wanna have a contrast of large leaves and tiny leaves. And it's more complicated than that, but I like to start there because I think 
I wish someone would have explained it to me this way to start, because I think I would have understood it better. So when you're at the nursery and you're buying plants, make sure when you put the plants together, you have some large leaves and some small leaves right next to each other. So here's some examples of that. I love looking at plant textures when there isn't a lot of color because it shows you how strong it can be. So look at these lamb's ears in the front against these coreopsis right behind them. Like it's this really big leaf and then you have a really tiny leaf next to it and it makes both of them pop. So if you had all fine textured or all coarse textured, it wouldn't be as strong. You need a little bit of both and that's what makes both of them pop. Texture is an art in itself, but it is amazing when you can really master this. And I've spent a lot of my life just focusing on texture because I feel like it's the hardest. But when you master, like botanic gardens do a great job at mastering uh, plant textures. But look at all these different textures. And you want to make sure, sometimes you can have two fine textures together. So for instance, on the left, we have this uh, small allium, this cow's like allium. And then we have on the bottom uh, right, a thyme. And they're both fine, but because the leaves are different, it's just enough of a different texture that makes it interesting which is cool. So this, this picture just shows you how a plant, when it blooms, it has a different texture than when it doesn't bloom. So this is ladies mantle. The leaves are very coarse, but the flowers are very fine. So depending on when it's blooming or not, it might change texture also. But look at the forms in this plant. I know we're not talking about form, but look at the forms in this planting also. You have some spiky plants and then you've got moundy plants, which is really cool. So textures work great with hardscapes too. So hardscapes are the non-living things. So in this case, we have the these beautiful grasses spilling out over these coarse textured stone. And when you have the combination of a, a large item with a tiny item, it's like clothing. But for those that are into fashion design, you can mix patterns as long as you have a tiny pattern with a big pattern. And that's perfectly fine because then it looks really cool when you have those two combinations together. Excellent. So here are some, oh, I wanna see what Lisa's question is here. Do you propose planning to include some native habitat to help promote native pollinators? That's, that's always a great idea. And I, I, yes, <laughs> I'm gonna give you the simple answer without veering off topic, but it is always great if you can include some native plants, but I'm not one to say you can only use natives, but if you are wanting to promote native pollinators, it's always better to use more native plants. So that, I'm glad you brought that up, exactly. Um, excellent. So this planting design, again, for texture, if you see the lamb's ear is a coarser textured plant, and then you've got the finer textured plant next to it. We should talk about theme gardens sometimes so we can talk about all these like pollinator designs and all of that, that'd be great. So here's a window box and you can see the plants at the top have really large leaves and then there's really tiny leaves at the bottom. This is at the silos in Waco, Texas. For those that have been there, that's a great place to go if you haven't been there. And look at these textures. Look at these large leaves against the tiny little leaves. So that's, that's the kind of thing that you're trying to get is the large and the tiny right next to each other. Excellent. So let's talk about color. Color is the most fleeting, like I had mentioned. It's important. Uh, I don't wanna say it's not important. And actually I will pick my plants often based on color because when you're in plant databases, it's easier to search by color than it is by plant form. Usually you can't search by plant form, unfortunately. So I will oftentimes narrow down my plants by color and then I'll go through those plants and make sure I have a good selection of texture and form also. So different ways you can organize color would be monochromatic. So this is a monochromatic design. You pick one color. So I like to see like you're at the paint swatch store and you pick one color and then it's all those colors within um, that, that paint swatch, which is really cool. And thank you, Matt, I just saw that you're, your butterfly, your pollinator article, which is great. So hopefully you can read some of those, your pollinator plant articles. So here's an example of another plant or color combination. It is complementary colors. If you want something bright and bold, you wanna have colors on the opposite of the color wheel. So the monochromatic, which is the slide before is calmer. This would be more bold. So blue and orange, uh, red and green, yellow and purple. And basically it's like, Viking colors, bear colors, and then Christmas. So those are like the most bold colors that you can put together. Or you can you can keep things calm and have like maybe earthy colors, or you can do grays, or you can do bright colors or warm colors. And the fun thing is I'm showing you some benches in these pictures because you can add color through containers and benches and paint and lots of paint. I like to say paint because paint's fun, um, but you can add color through other elements too. 
but how beautiful when a when a designer looks at detail like this where they paint the bench red knowing that their plants are going to be red so it looks really cool this garden right here is in memphis and one of my favorite gardens, look at the detail. She knew that this was a purple and yellow garden and she even painted her bench with the purple in it. So she was very careful about the plants that she choose or chose and made sure that all the theme colors went together, which is really fun. Love it, love it, love it. So let's talk, oh, do we, I know we're getting close to being done now. We're already at 440. So you want me to just keep going, Matt? I think I'm gonna keep going. Keep going, yep. Okay, okay. cool. <laughs> I'm gonna yeah, keep for people. Then. We'll, we'll, we'll finish through the presentation and if people want have to sign off for some reason, they can always watch the replay on this, so. Perfect, perfect. So the, the next thing I wanna talk about are those little itty bitty plants in the front of the planting bed. So oftentimes we put all these like big trees and shrubs and even tall perennials, but we don't always consider the small plants. And I like to see those as like the trim of your garden. And I honestly didn't consider it myself until I worked at Ryman Gardens many years ago and the Hort staff there, they are amazing at putting those little trim plants in the front. So this is at Duke Gardens actually. And if you can see these really short plants underneath the trees, and it's kind of that trim, it kind of just fills in the front of those beds. So here's another great example of how those, those front bed plantings just kind of spill out. I especially love it when they spill out onto hardscapes. On the lawn, not so good because you have to, then you cut them off, but onto like a patio, like I love plants that spill out onto patios. And again, these are just some more short plants that they spill out onto different patios. And this is in Santa Fe. And I just, I mean, just a little detail of that seed. I'm just kind of tucked in in front of that lavender. And it's just an amazing touch. And then again, this beautiful walkway. And then you have all these beautiful ground coverage just kind of tucked in. So don't forget about these itty bitty little plants that you can just tuck in, you know, with whether it's in the front of a bed, in paving, wherever it might be. Because those are like the coolest plants. I, I love that. That's like, to me, that's like, that is the, the icing on the cake. So of course there's winter interest. And the thing I want to mention about winter interest, we hear this all the time, but the thing about winter interest for those of us that live in a cold climate, a lot of you are in warm climates, so you don't have to worry about this, but only put it where you're going to enjoy it. So a lot of us put a lot of time into having winter interest in areas of our yard that we never see in the winter, because think about it. We, park our car, we either go through the driveway or through the garage into the house, or we always maybe use the side door. If we have like an acreage, maybe we never go out in the, the back 40 of the acreage. Put the winter interest plants where you're going to enjoy them in the winter. Maybe you have a beautiful kitchen that has a window that looks out into your yard. Maybe that's where you should put the winter interest. So think about where you can put plants that have beautiful twigs and bark and berries and where can you see them in the winter time so you can actually enjoy them? So place them where you can enjoy them. That's really important. So number eight, one of my favorites, fill your beds with plants. We want to make sure that we fill our beds with plants. So oftentimes we have people that come to us and they say, uh, like my students, and we'll, we'll do a design for somebody and they'll say, we don't want our plants to touch. We want them as far apart as we can. Well, the problem is, is when you do that, and I don't know if, if, if everybody has done this in their own yard, if you have an empty bed like this, what happens long term? I mean, does it actually stay clear like this or do weeds start popping up like this? I know, I know in my yard, if I don't have anything planted in a mulch area, weeds will start popping up. So my, our, many people's philosophies, if you read many books and, and if you garden a lot, you know this, is if you fill the plants with fill the beds with plants that you want and you have them thick and you actually fill your beds with plants, you won't have other plants popping through. Now, I know it's not perfect. We're all going to have plants popping up just like this. Here's another one. It's empty. So we're going to have weeds pop up just like that. But we don't want that. We want beds like this. And I'm not saying that weeds don't come up in here. We all know in the springtime, we're still going to have some weeds come up. I know in my own gardens, my, my previous house, the beds were very, very thick. Thanks, Cheryl. I see somebody run, sneaking off. Um, I see in my, in my last yard, my plants were very thick. And in the spring, I did have to pull some weeds. But as the plants filled in, you don't have to pull them anymore. And the, the other, this is the other cool thing. The more full your beds are, long term, you don't have to keep mulching. The mulch to me is just the start to get the plants established. Once the plants are established, 
you don't have to keep filling it with mulch. The plants become the mulch. They call it green mulch when the plants themselves at a ground cover level start to keep those weeds down, which is really cool. So this is my perennial border many years ago, probably 10 or 15 years ago. It's changed dramatically since then at, our, at my old house, but you can see it's full and this is what helps keep the weeds down. So for those that are big gardeners, you know that the, the more plants you have in the beds, the more the weeds stay down or the, the plants that you don't want in there. So again, these are just some examples of plants that are just full. Believe it or not, this is in Boston. I know it doesn't, it looks very tropical. This person collects a lot of tropical plants then brings them out in containers, but it's just so awesome, it's full. And again, here's another planting design. They fill their beds, which is really awesome. This is my yard, believe it or not, but the one house I live in right now, and there's Gunther walking in the background. But this, we're still working. It looks like the beds are full, but they're not. <laughs> we are actually still working on filling the beds. But that's the ultimate goal is to keep filling the beds so it's a little bit easier to maintain because we don't have lawn. We have all shade. How do you account for the growth of the plants as they mature when factoring in the fullness? That is a great question. So you need to understand the full growth of the plant. And then I like to overlap plants just a little bit. So if a plant gets six feet, I like to have them maybe five feet apart. I like to have them just a little, I like them, I like them to touch each other. And not only that, and, and this presentation doesn't talk about this, but you also need, so if you have a shrub up high, you need some plants underneath it also, some ground covers to fill in underneath. So they're touching at the top a little bit, but then you have got a shade loving ground cover that's underneath them all. And that's a whole nother discussion, a whole nother topic that we can talk about. Um, so you do need to consider the fullness, but it's okay for plants to touch each other. They do touch each other in the real world. So you just wanna make sure they touch each other enough so they look masked, because you want the massing, like we talked about already, and you wanna fill in the bed and layers of vertically too, which we're not gonna talk about in this presentation, but that's a great question, I love it. So here's an example of a planting design. So again, looking from the sky, looking down, and you can see how my plants are touching, so I'm glad you asked that question. So if these three plants right here on the top right are the same plant, do you see how I overlap them just slightly so they're touching each other? So I'm I'm actually drawing this at full mature size. Um, and we've got questions about shade loving plants. And unfortunately, we're not going to have time to cover all that. But maybe Matt can find some wonderful extension publication on shade plants. I'm sure we got something out there. Somebody asked, do you use river rock? Um, no, I do not believe in river rock in climates that don't normally. So if, if you're air, so the Midwest, let's use this as an example. In the Midwest, it is not a natural occurrence in nature to have river rock as a ground cover. So I would not use river rock as a mulch here. Now I understand if you're in Tucson, Arizona, that's a totally different climate and it is natural for that to happen. Because rock is not a uh, healthy, it's not, it's not a healthy ground cover. It does not promote the healthy plant growth. I can keep going on about that, but no, I do not promote that, especially in the Midwest, I do not. Um, can you speak about perennial versus annual balance? I don't know if I have a formula for that. I do mostly perennials in my beds and I do, I like to have, I personally like to have a lot of woody plants and perennial plants and evergreens. So deciduous, which loses their leaves, evergreen, which keeps their leaves. And we're talking about the Midwest here. And then of course, um, herbaceous plants or perennial plants. I like to have a mix of all of those and, I, and, and, and a formula, I'm not sure if I have a formula. I kind of like to see, I mean, if you had to have a formula, maybe a third, 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 but I'd like to have some structure in the winter time. So I like to have a lot of woody plants mixed in with my herbaceous plants. But annuals versus perennial, I guess I use, I personally use more perennials, but that might be different for people that are in warmer climates. And I, I don't have as much experience with that. Okay, so we wanna layer our plants. And I had mentioned layering in a vertical way. I just kind of briefly mentioned that, but I'm talking more horizontally also here. So just again, when we're putting planting beds in front of our house, don't be afraid to have two, three, four layers of plants. Don't feel like you just have to have one row of yous. Like, can we have three or four or five rows of plants? So don't be afraid to do that. And, and especially if your house is a two-story house, maybe make the beds a little bit wider. They don't have, to, unless you only, if you only have three feet, that's one thing. But if you have the space, make them a little bit wider. Excellent. So these are just some great examples of layering your plants. And it could be formal or traditional or informal, however you want to do it. So and this is a house that I saw in 
this was in Seattle, actually, I think. But anyway, so yeah, you can see all these layers of plants. This is also in Seattle. Look how amazing this is. This is a side yard. I love side yards. Like they're one of my things that I love. I love when people do all these cool things. But yeah, don't be afraid to layer your plants. So here again is a drawing from Plan View again, so you can see that. So this is one, uh, a really quick tip. Some of you have farms or you've got long, or you got an acreage where you have this long driveway coming into your yard and you have these long borders of plants. Like, how do I do all these plants? I mean, you can have all kinds of different plants in a long border. One of the ways that I, I, I teach people to make it easier for them is to create maybe a 10 foot long border that they really like, and then just keep repeating that pattern as you go down. So here's some other examples of that. So if you've got a long linear space and you're not sure how to use it, maybe just design a small section of it and then just keep repeating that pattern down a little bit. That's just a, a, a little easier way to be able to handle a long space if you've got that. Excellent. And then Aaron asked, should we have a ratio of how wide versus length on a garden bed? I don't have a ratio. You think there, and if there is one, I don't know what that would be. Um, I just like to look at the house in, in terms of the scale. Like, does it feel like it's too tiny or not? And sometimes you just need to take a photo and put tracing paper over it and just play with your different heights and your different compositions of forms and just see if it feels right. So hopefully that helps a little bit, Aaron. So though, unfortunately there's no ratio. Um, so this is a bonus tip and this, and Matt's gonna share a link. I actually have a, a whole article on this or a whole blog, po a blog post on this, how I create my plant list. And I make a list of plants first of some, so someone had mentioned what, what are shade plants that she could use. So I like to create a list of potential plants that I could use in a certain area, if it's shade or if it's sun or if it's dry or if it's wet. I create my list first, I do all this research. And then when I start designing, I have this, there you go, thanks Matt. So there's that link to uh, how I narrow down my plants. It's kind of a funneling system. I look at the zone and then I look at the cultural reasons and then I look at a theme. And so this is just a little tip that I wanted to throw in there because I know sometimes just picking the plants can be a tough, thing to do. So, um, and picking up plants, I'm supposed to mention that you're supposed to go to your master gardener plant sales to get plants this spring. So don't forget that stuff when you are choosing plants, make sure you do that. Last tip, and this is the most important one, you want to make sure that you experiment. So I had a friend that would put plants in the ground and she would never move them or, or even worse, she would put a, she'd buy a plant she not put it in the ground and she would stare at it for months and be like, I don't know where I should put this. I'm just, I'm not really sure. And she would be unsure about it again and again. And this is my thought, put it in the ground. I mean, I understand trees and shrubs, trees in particular, you can't move as much perennials and small shrubs. You can move them later if you need to. So experiment, you can add things to, you know, plants. Like if you put too many fine textured plants in the next summer, it's an excuse to go shopping for some coarse textured plants. So, just experiment and have fun and don't feel like it's permanent. So here's just some examples at the end to show some great planting design that I've seen on, on garden tours. So this one is in Seattle and you can see these great textures, the great forms in these planters, which I love. And this one actually is, I think almost all of these are in Seattle, <laughs> which is crazy. That was my last trip. But again, a little bit of color, a little bit of texture. It's emphasizing the space. This is a tiny space, but look at how those plants are emphasizing that space. It's really cool. Maybe you're someone that likes to have something more formal. Like you want a spalier growing on the wall and you want trimmed hedges. That's perfectly fine. Whatever your style is. This is actually, I'm in Des Moines. This is just down the street for me. I love this planting. I'm like, this person is like, this is like the coolest planting, but I love it. And then here's another one. I mean, how to use plants so you can create a certain character emphasizing your spaces, bringing in food and wildlife and, and make adding beauty, how all these different things that you can do in your own yard with plants is absolutely amazing. And then that's the last slide. And we still have a few minutes for questions. Let's see, do we have any more yeah, questions we that we want to answer, Matt? <laughs> well, we've got a few that have come in. Obviously we've done a really nice job of answering them throughout. So people are obviously great questions. Excellent. Um, I'll get to one that was just asked here. It's, pretty, it's a pretty specific question, but I think okay. that's, that's okay for this purpose. Do you recommend having a walkway straight out from your front door separate from your driveway if you don't have a sidewalk? Any any suggestions there, Lisa? Um, I, it depends on the house itself. A lot of design questions are looking at the house and deciding if it, yeah. if it makes sense with the house. I personally like a straight walkway, but it should be connected to the driveway in some way, just so you don't have to walk all the way to the sidewalk and then go back to your car. But I, 
I personally like a sidewalk that goes out to the street. I mean, my house happens to have that, but I have an old house and old houses did that. So if it makes sense and it makes you happy to welcome people in from the front and not have to make them come through the drive, I think that's awesome. I personally like people walking in from the street or from the sidewalk um, from out front. So definitely if, if that's something that it fits with your yard, it's like I said, it's different for each yard. So hopefully, hopefully that helps a little bit. One more that came yeah. in. Um, this is about treating your, uh, recommend testing your soil for nutrients, pH, and using that knowledge for planning design. I think that's an interesting question, a more scientific question, but what are your thoughts there? So I would say if you have a site that has history of challenges and your homeowners can tell you that, or if I guess I'm used to working with people that are actually designing for clients, you're probably designing for yourself. If you feel like your site might be complicated, I would probably get it tested. I've, I'll be honest, I've never tested mine because I've always lived in old houses and my and our soil has been amazing. And I've never had issues with that. Um, but if you're having issues growing things, then I would definitely get it tested. And then you can make sure you buy plants that can handle those conditions. So something that we teach and we, and we read about a lot is don't try to change your soil, try to work with the soil you've got. So once you learn that maybe it's high acidity or basic soil or whatever it might be, then do some research and find out what plants work in those soils. So I don't check my soils all the time, I admit. But if I had, if I was working with a client that said, you know what, we are having so many issues and I would definitely get it checked to make sure because something might be going on there that you want to know about. That's great. Oh, this is a good one too. Okay. Something that I don't think we talked a lot about, but tip, well, this make this the last question, but thanks so much for everyone who, who added your questions in the comments. Any tips yeah. for incorporating food producing plants? Um, I don't have specific tips and that's something that I know that's a big trend right now is to include um, food producing plants in your landscape. So we've been experimenting a little bit. So in our right of way out front, we are, we planted, we call it a matrix planting. And that's, like I said, that's a whole nother presentation, but that's an advanced planting model where you have plants evenly mixed within a bed. So I have grasses and alliums in there, but we mixed in strawberries for the texture. And we thought then we can have strawberries too. So there are some food producing plants like strawberries or rhubarb that are perennial that you can just, I mean, and some of them have really great texture. So you can just kind of mix them in with other plantings in your perennial beds. Now, annuals in particular, I've never mixed in annual vegetables in my in my beds. Usually I do annuals in containers like herbs and things. Um, so yeah, I mean, if it's a perennial, I would say just mix it in and make sure you understand the form and the texture and the color so it works with the rest of the plants. That's my suggestion for edibles, but I'm, not, I'm definitely not an expert in edible plants, but that's how we do it. We just kind of tuck it in with all the other plants and just treat it as an ornamental, but then eat the goodness from those plants, which is nice. Absolutely. Excellent. That's a great question. Well, wow. We are just at an hour, just under an hour now. So I'm going to bring Katie and Susan back. And we okay. just really want to thank you guys for this great information. I think a lot of people have found this interesting. I, obviously, uh, people asking questions, uh, everybody's space is different, right? So um, right. Some, some really good ideas here for people, I think, just in general. Um, but those are some great tips. Thanks so much, Lisa. And You're Susan. welcome. That you, it makes you realize how much there's the no, there's so much information. And we all, there's so much we all want to well, ask. I know. But you were giving me too so much, much credit for posting those links because Susan was the one providing all those, oh, great, those great resources. <laughs> thank you, Susan. Susan's amazing too. <laughs> thank you, Susan. I appreciate it. <laughs> awesome. Well, well, thank you both for joining us today uh, on a Monday uh, as people. Yes get ready for spring and looking to, to add some plants to their, to their yards. Really perfect timing. And we really appreciate you guys both for partnering with us uh, on this event. Thank yeah, you, thank so, you much. so much. We All appreciate right. it. Thank you both. We'll kick, we'll kick Susan and Lisa off, but Katie, I know we have another prize to give away. Maybe yes, two prizes two. actually. We we'll have give... two prizes to give away before we sign off. Uh, okay. So the next one will go to David, David Fusen in Des Moines, who also is an alumni association life member. So thank you for your membership, David. Um, and we will be in touch with how you can get your prize. And Matt, I think for the last one, I'm just going to have you yeah. close your eyes and pick someone from well, the chat. Asked, yeah, we asked people to let us know where they're watching from. So I'm just gonna scroll back and look and find Linda will be our, Linda, our perfect. third from Pocatello, Idaho, all the way, not, not Iowa, Idaho. Idaho. <laughs> 
get those Perfect. confused sometimes. But obviously people here know the difference between Iowa and Idaho, the corn yes. and potato states. All right, corn thanks so much for, for tuning in and commenting. We had so much fun. I know I got a lot of ideas. I think I, need to, I think I need to have Lisa come over to my, my blank canvas <laughs> of a new house and, and work on some landscaping ideas for me. But really so much fun. Again, we wanna thank Lisa and Susan for partnering with us on this event. And we really appreciate all of you guys spending your Monday evening with us. We learned a lot about gardening and hope you can take some tips with you into your own home. Thanks everyone for watching and have a great rest of your day. Bye.